Stephen Sizer is a Church of England minister with a long history of anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist activity. In May 2022, he appeared before a Church of England disciplinary tribunal following a complaint made by the Board of Deputies of British Jews in 2018. The verdict, which at the time of recording was unknown, was handed down on the afternoon of Tuesday the 6th of December. This event consists of initial reflections on that verdict and its wider significance. The speaker is James Mendelssohn, who is a senior lecturer in law at the University of the West of England. OK, so um, as David says, I'm just going to give some initial reflections on the uh, Stephen Sizer verdict. Um, should stress there very much initial reflections. The verdict came out, at, I think, about half past two or maybe three o'clock. Um, so I've only read it through once. Um, so this is very much sort of on the hoof. Um, like all good lecturers, I finished my slides about 30 seconds before this event started. So they won't be the most polished slides that um, have ever been produced, but I'll try and give a flavour for, for what has happened. Um, so first of all, the headline is that Stephen Sizer, um, according to a Church of England tribunal, um, engaged in anti-Semitic activity. Okay, the Board of Activities, Board of, board of Jews, Board of, of Deputies, sorry, pardon me, the Board of Deputies of British Jews brought a complaint against him that he had engaged in anti-Semitic activity and the tribunal has found that. So that's the headline and the headline is that this is a good day for British Jews and it's a good day for people who are concerned about uh, anti-Semitism. And I do want to at the start just commend the Board of Deputies for pursuing this complaint um, and you know, trying to uh, get this man called to account over many years. Um, so, so well done to the Board. Okay, that's the headline. This is where we're heading. Um, I'll give some background on who this man is, because I guess not everyone, particularly people from overseas will necessarily be familiar. Why he's controversial, um, we'll think about previous complaints that were made against him, the current complaint, and then I'll finish off by talking about his uh, connection with uh, Viva Palestina. Um, if I go too quickly, perhaps someone can wave at me and let me know, um, or alternatively, if I go too slowly. Um, but firstly, the background, who is he? So he is an ordained minister in the Church of England. Uh, he's a vicar um, for 20 years from 1997 to 2017. He was the vicar of a church called Christ Church Virginia Water, uh, which is in Surrey in the south of England. Uh, theologically, he's an evangelical. And what I mean by that very basically is he's somebody who takes the Bible seriously. OK, he believes the Bible and he takes it seriously. But and this is important. He's an evangelical in the British sense, not in the uh, US sense. So evangelicals in the USA are typically very supportive of Israel. That is not the case in the UK, as and Stephen Sizer is a good example of that. Uh, for many years, he has been a supporter of the Palestinians and particularly of Palestinian Christians. He, for an equally long time, he has been a very strong opponent of Israel and also of Christian Zionism, by which I mean Christians who support the state of Israel for theological reasons. Uh, he's been a very uh, strong opponent of both for many years. Uh, he wrote two major books on that theme. Um, one in 2004 called Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon, and another one called Zion's Christian Soldiers in uh, 2007. So that's who he is. Why is he controversial? So I'm just going to run through a few things that he has done and said over the years. Um, I could have chosen many other examples. So these are just a flavour um, so back in October 1996, he wrote in a, uh, a Christian newspaper, um, neither Dole nor Clinton will dare upset the Jewish lobby. So this is around the time of the US elections. And he was saying that well, both candidates 
were scared of the Jewish lobby. Um, in his 2004 book, um, there's a footnote uh, towards the end where he alleges Israeli complicity in 9-11. Um, in the same book, uh, in the 19, he writes, in the 1930s, the German Zionist Federation, the Stern Gang, Vladimir Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist Zionism, were all sympathetic towards fascism or collaborated with the Nazis. Those in the UK will recognise that's what Ken Livingstone said. That's what got Ken Livingstone kicked out of Labour. Um, in the same book, he refers to someone called Dale Crowley as a religious broadcaster. Um, actually, Dale Crowley was associated with the American far right um, and he contributed to Holocaust denier magazines. Uh, 2006, this is the letter that David referred to a moment ago. He wrote to The Independent um, about uh, the BDS movement and opponents of BDS, and he described opponents of BDS, including the then chief rabbi, as the people in the shadows. So very much someone who is pushing the idea of conspiracy theories and Jews or Zionists behind the scenes pulling the strings. Um, in 2006, he uh, went to, uh, he visited Israel, Palestine. He took this picture of the security barrier and you can see the caption at the bottom, which says, uh, Arbeit macht frei. Um, that's far from the only time that he has equated Israeli policies with the Holocaust. Um, on press TV in 2008, he said, um, the Holocaust has been perpetuated over the last 40 or 50 years, it's the Palestinians who are going through their Nakba now. Um, a couple of years later, this was some, these some pictures he took of Israeli soldiers in Bethlehem, and look at the caption he's given them, Herod soldiers operating in Bethlehem today. Um, so in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Herod is the wicked king who tries to kill the baby Jesus, so what Stephen Sides are doing here, he is combining the Christ-killing libel and the baby-killing libel in one uh, caption. Uh, same, same month, actually, a blog post where he wrote about Hillary Clinton rebuking Israel for uh, settlements. Um, and part of his title is Payback for Monica, okay, uh, by which is meant Monica Lewinsky. So although he insists that criticism of Israel and prejudice against Jewish people are separate, what he's doing here, he is linking an American Jew with the state of Israel. Um, here's another example, Malaysian TV this time in June 2011, he said this, the far right in Britain is forming an alliance with Zionists because their common enemy are the Muslims. And it's ironic that the very people who favored the work of Hitler are now working with the Zionists, the English Defence League, for example, against the Muslims because they view them as a threat. So that's really pretty nasty, isn't it? Tying together Zionists, which we all know in is a, a word that about 90% of British Jews will identify with, including me, including, I guess, lots of us. So identifying us with people who favour the work of Hitler. Okay, that's... Uh, pretty uh, speaks for itself, I think. The same T interview, um, he was asked about um, why Congress gave Benjamin Netanyahu a round of applause. And he said this, they bought every single one of those politicians. They won't dare criticize Israel because the Israel lobby will fund their competitors, their opponents, and they'll be out of office. Um, so again, a flavor for the sort of things he has said and done. Um, uh, 2011 to 2012, I could have given lots more examples of these, but he made some uh, links on his blog and his Facebook page to several websites which are explicitly anti-Semitic. Um, the Palestine Telegraph in July 2011, The Ugly Truth in October 2011, um, veterans today in March 2012. I put a few screenshots of his Facebook posts. Perhaps you can make out in this uh, second one, uh, the one below. Perhaps you can make out the um, uh, this one here 
Oh, sorry, that wasn't what I meant to do. Perhaps you can make out in the second one, the cartoon by Latouf, which has an Israeli soldier um, sort of mocked up as a Holocaust victim. Um, so, you know, playing around with his ideas of equating the Holocaust with Israeli policy uh, and so on. Um, so I say that's just a flavor. I could have given lots and lots of other examples of the sort of things that he has said and done over the years, which go some way beyond merely criticizing Israel. What happened next? So there were a couple of previous complaints against him by the Board of Deputies. The first one was started in uh, October 2012, when the Board of Deputies made a formal complaint about him to the Church of England. Um, the Board was supported in that by the Community Security Trust uh, and the Jewish Leadership Council. This was mainly about his online activity, um, so the links he posted, um, not only, but mainly about those. Um, and it was resolved in 2013 by a conciliation agreement. So the board didn't withdraw their complaint, but they agreed a way to move forward. And what that entailed was that Stephen Sizer would have his um, online activity monitored by uh, a couple, I think two or three observers. So that was in 20, 2012, 2013. In 2015, um, Steen Sizer posted a link on his Facebook page, which suggested that Israel was behind 9-11. Um, it was in Holocaust Memorial Week. The um, board deputies made another complaint to his bishop, and the bishop responded by banning him from using social media. Um, which was for six months, and then also banned him from preaching or teaching on anything connected with the Middle East. Um, and that ban remained in place until he retired from being a parish priest in spring of 2017. And following his retirement, he relocated to Southampton. Now, when Church of England vicars retire, um, they don't stop being subject to the oversight of a bishop. So when he moved to Southampton, he became subject to the Bishop of Winchester. Um, that's important for what follows next. Um, and around the same time, he set up a new charity um, called Peacemaker Trust. So as of now, he's a retired vicar who directs this charity. So all of that is background. What about the current complaint or the one where the verdict has just been announced? So this was initiated by another complaint by the Board of Deputies in 2018. Um, they made a complaint to the Bishop of Winchester because that's where he's now based. And what the Bishop did when it received that complaint was to withdraw his permission to officiate. So permission to officiate is um, basically a license to preach and teach and lead services in the Church of England. OK, it's what you need to do if you want to be. Uh, it's what you need in order to function as a vicar. So the bishop withdrew this uh, permission to officiate. And the bishop also decided that the charges should be heard by a disciplinary tribunal. Stephen Sizer exercised his rights to have a hearing in public, and that hearing took place in May of this year. Um, not entirely clear why it took so long to happen, um, but it took place in May, and the verdict is what was delivered today. Um, the panel for that hearing, for that tribunal, it consisted of five members, uh, one of whom is a judge, by which I mean a, a sort of normal judge in the secular courts, um, two clergymen and two lay members. Um, the witnesses for the board were Mary van der Zyl, who is the current president, and Jonathan Arkush, who is the uh, previous president. Um, Stephen Sizer gave evidence and there were various uh, witnesses who appeared um, on his behalf. Um, there were a couple of expert uh, witnesses as well, 
um, who basically were there to give their views and evidence on why IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of antisemitism, should or should not be used. So arguing that it should be used by the uh, panel was uh, Bishop Michael Ipgrave. So he's a Church of England bishop who sort of specialises on Christian Jewish relations, um, arguing against the use of IRA. So on behalf of Stephen Sizer was Anthony Lerman, um, which I'm sure is a name a lot of us will recognise as a you know, quite well-known uh, anti-Zionist Jew. So evidence for and for and against. Um, what were the charges? So basically there were two charges. Um, the first was that Stephen Sizer had um, been engaged in conduct unbecoming or inappropriate to the work of a clergyman in that he provoked and offended the Jewish community and or that he engaged in anti-Semitic activity. Okay, so the first charge, it's got two limbs that he conducted, he, he, yeah, he did conduct unbecoming to work for clergymen or he engaged in anti-Semitic activity or both. Um, the second charge is that his conduct was in breach of canon law, so church law, um, that wasn't considered. Um, it was only the first one that was considered. Um, there were, the charges were based on 11 separate allegations from 2005 to 2018, some of which I knew about, some of which I didn't, some of which I think I probably had known about, but then forgot. Um, and for each one of those, Stephen Sizer didn't deny what had happened. Okay, he didn't deny doing any of the things um, what he did deny was what flowed from them, in other words, that they were in any way anti-Semitic. So what I'm going to do now is run through those 11 charges, I'll summarise them, and I'll just sort of try and summarise the decision that the panel reached on each of those charges. Um, so this is the first charge, which is that he participated in a conference um, run by the Islamic Human Rights Commission in 2005, which was titled Towards a New Liberation Theology. Um, the panel accepted that the Jewish community was provoked, um, but not that it was unbecoming and not that it was anti-Semitic activity. Okay, that's the first charge. Um, the second charge was that he met N uh, Sheikh Nabil Kauk, who is a senior commander of Hezbollah um, sometime in the summer of 2006. The panel accepted that the Jewish community was provoked, said that it was conduct unbecoming of a clergyman, but not anti-Semitic activity. Um, the third charge is that he spoke at a conference in Indonesia in May 2008 alongside someone called Fred Tobin, who is a Holocaust denier. Uh, the panel accepted that the Jewish community were offended, um, said it was an example where he did not take into account his role as a public representative of the church, and he showed a lack of sensitivity to the Jewish community. But this wasn't conduct unbecoming, and it wasn't anti-Semitic activity. Um, charge four is that in June 2008, he promoted, he circulated an article written by Michael Hoffman, who is a Holocaust denier uh, and an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist. Um, this one, the panel said, it was neither conduct unbecoming, nor was it anti-Semitic activity. Why? Because it couldn't be sure when Sizer had posted it or rather, sorry, it, couldn't, it knew when Sizer had posted it, but it couldn't be sure whether that was before or after an anti-Semitic edition. Um, so that's four charges. Charge five um, is that he cited Holocaust deniers and figures from the far right, particularly Dale Crowley, in or around January 20, uh, 2009. Um, again, the panel accepted that the Jewish community was offended, but said it wasn't conduct unbecoming, it wasn't anti-Semitic activity, because it didn't have any evidence that Sizer knew about Crowley's views. 
charge six is that in September 2010, he posted a link to an article entitled The Mother of All Coincidences, which speculates on Israeli involvement in 9-11. Once again, accepted that the Jewish community was offended. It said the tribunal considers that the respondent as an ordained minister should not have been giving the oxygen of publicity to such an article said that it was conduct unbecoming, one member of the panel dissenting, but it wasn't anti-Semitic activity. Um, for that particular bit, I found the reasoning a bit thin. I couldn't see why they'd said it wasn't anti-Semitic activity. Charge seven is this, that in June 2011, he accompanied and defended uh, a guy called Ray Salah, who was a leader of the Islamic movement in Israel. So those of you based in Britain might remember this. Ray Salah, um, leader of uh, the Islamic movement in Israel, um, he came to the UK despite a home office ban, um, and the ban related to anti-Semitic speeches he had given in Israel. The uh, Again, accept, well, the panel accepts the Jewish community was offended, once again, considers that it demonstrated the respondent's lack of awareness of being a public representative of the church uh, and a lack of sensitivity to the um, to the Jewish community, but not that it was conduct unbecoming and not that it was anti-Semitic activity. Why? This is one I found quite surprising. Um, they said based on the dates of the evidence presented, it wasn't clear to them when or whether it would have been possible for size to become aware of the, this guy's views. Charge eight, which is the key one, is that um, is based on his 2015 Facebook post uh, of an article from uh, a, a site called Wikispooks, which promoted the idea that Israel was behind 9-11. And for this one, I will read uh, from the judgment at length. Um, bear in mind, this is a Church of England discipline tribunal. Church of England very rarely comes off the fence on, on anything. It's an institution that generally sits on the fence because it wants to keep different parties in harmony. Um, but this is, uh, uh, well, the, these words will speak for themselves. The tribunal finds the article in its tone and content truly shocking. It has not set out ex extracts from a highly repellent article in this decision. After careful consideration, it finds the respondent's evidence that he had not read the article in full before he posted the link to be implausible and untrue. Despite repeatedly saying he was contrite, he showed scant evidence of being, of being so. On this occasion, the respondent crossed the line and in reposting the article, he was engaging in anti-Semitic activity. It rejects the respondent's assertion that the article raised serious issues that required public consideration. The article goes far beyond the criticism of Israel and is virulently anti-Semitic in its content. Okay, that is pretty strong stuff. So this is the one, it's the only one where both boxes were ticked, that it was both conduct unbecoming of a clergyman and it was anti-Semitic activity. Uh, two more, sorry, three more charges to look at. Um, this is the, uh, so charge nine is that he attended an event in October 2016 uh, at the, in Parliament chaired by uh, Baroness Tong. Those of you familiar with Baroness Tong will know that um, she has a, a dodgy track record of her own, shall we say, um, and uh, the, the, the not only did he attend, but this was in breach of his agreement not to get involved with stuff connected with the Middle East. Um, once again, the panel said it demonstrated his lack of awareness of his being a public representative of the church. It showed a lack of sensitivity to the Jewish community, but it wasn't conduct unbecoming. It wasn't anti-Semitic activity. Um, charge 10 is that in an interview in March 2018 on Australian radio, um, he defended the link he posted in 2015 to the article blaming Israel for 9-11. Um, again, pretty strong stuff of great concern that the respondent was not more contrite in his apology for posting the article. He was also disingenuous in his answers, 
Um, the panel found this was conduct unbecoming. One member dissented, but it wasn't anti-Semitic activity. That's one that surprises me because I think that if posting the link in the first place was anti-Semitic, defending it would be anti-Semitic as well. Um, so that's one I couldn't really uh, find that one hard to understand. Um, and the final one um, was about him posting an item on his Facebook page in August 2018 in relation to Jeremy Corbyn being a victim of the hidden hands of Zionists. Um, what does the panel say? Concerns about the respondent's judgment in posting the article, but not conduct unbecoming and not anti-Semitic activity, which again is something that surprised me. In summary, those 11 allegations, seven of them weren't proven. Three of them, conduct unbecoming of a clergyman was proven, but not anti-Semitic activity. Um, only one, in only one, was conduct unbecoming and anti-Semitic activity proven. And that was the instance of him um, posting the uh, the article in nine uh, in 2015 which pushed uh, the, the idea of Israeli involvement in 9-11. Um, now my view, um, I thought something like that would probably happen. I should say I attended the last two days as an observer um, so I didn't get all of the background but I did get a flavour of it and I thought probably some of the allegations wouldn't be proven, um, some of them might um, but I thought one in particular he would find very hard to get out of, um, which was the example of posting the, uh, the, the link about Israeli involvement in 9-11. Um, what is perhaps of more significance is that the panel did decide to follow IRA, okay, in deciding what is and is not anti-Semitic. Um, if it had not followed IRA, um, a tribunal like this doesn't set a precedent for other courts, okay? It sits outside of uh, the main court system. So it wouldn't establish a binding legal precedent for other courts to follow, but I think it would nevertheless have been significant. So it's a good thing in my view that the panel decided to follow IRA. Um, this is quite a striking paragraph from the judgment. Um, which maybe David wants to say something about in a moment as well. Um, in light of its findings, the tribunal does not conclude that the respondent is anti-Semitic by nature. So it didn't look into his head and try and work out, is this person an anti-Semite? Okay, but what it did do, um, five lines up, it does conclude, however, that by posting the link to the Facebook page in January 2015, he was engaged in anti-Semitic activity. So they try, try to work out what's going on in his head. They don't try and peer into his soul, but they do look at what he has said and done. Um, and then it adds, it does consider that there is a regrettably a pattern of behavior which falls short of the standard to which the respondent should have aspired as an ordained minister. Okay, that's pretty strong stuff. And, um, so too is the uh, this bit here. I mean, Church of James, England. James, James, and, James, James David. Oh can, yeah, can go, I just, go about something there. While you, while you've got that one up on the on the, on the screen, can I just look at that with people really carefully because it seems to me really important um, that people will say, and we've already seen it online already, that. Um, that he's exonerated of anti-Semitism, right? That, that, that the tribunal said he's not anti-Semitic by nature. And then that um, uh, um, his motives were not anti-Semitic, right? That he did anti-Semitic things, but he wasn't anti-Semitic by nature and he, and he wasn't motivated by anti-Semitism. But if you read those words very carefully, they don't exonerate him at all. What they say is the tribunal does not conclude that the respondent is anti-Semitic by nature. It doesn't say that the tribunal, the tribunal concludes that he is not anti-Semitic by nature. So it says, in effect, that the tribunal has no 
uh, has made no determination about whether he is anti-Semitic by nature. Um, I mean, feel free to come back on that. But it seems to me that the wording is very clear, that the tribunal does not conclude that the respondent is anti-Semitic by nature, but neither does it conclude that the respondent is not anti-Semitic by nature. And it was interested in what was said and done and not whatever by nature means. And um, of course, that would be a really interesting question to find out what the tribunal had in mind when it talked about um, somebody being anti-Semitic by nature. And the same is for the next part, the, the next sentence, um, that the finding is consistent with the views expressed by Bishop Watson in his statement, who concluded that he did not consider that the respondent's motives were anti-Semitic. But it does not say that the tribunal is inconsistent with somebody who does think that Sizer's motives were anti-Semitic. So I think the wording is very important because it would be used to exonerate him and um, it doesn't do that. And of course, that's even before you get into the discussion about the difference between somebody being anti-Semitic by nature or by motive or by action. And of course, down the, the, the bit that you've underlined at the bottom is clear that um, there is anti-Semitic activity. Yeah, thanks, Dave. That's very helpful. Um, I should just say this paragraph is already being used by Stephen Side's supporters, um, particularly the uh, Islamic Human Rights Commission, to say that he's been uh, exonerated. So, but yeah, I think so. I think David's input there is very uh, helpful. Um, um, while, I'm in, while I'm intervening, James, um, is there anything in the judgment that says what it means to be anti-Semitic by nature, uh, as opposed to what it means to be anti-Semitic because you have done anti-Semitic things? Uh, if there was, I, I'm afraid I didn't pick it up. Or by motive. And because it's a really strange claim, right, that, that um, he's been doing things that are anti-Semitic or you know, all of these lesser charges that, that are uh, conduct, conduct unbecoming or that are provoking or offending or lack certain sensitivity. The Jewish community has been doing these things for 15 years um, and angrily denying it. So, so how then would we possibly explain that if not by reference to a kind of underlying anti-Semitism? Uh, I'm just doing a word search, okay, um, for the nature. So, no, it doesn't talk about what it would mean to be anti-Semitic by nature. And let me do another word search by, uh, for the word mm. motive. Yeah, there's only one reference to motives. So it's not something that really expands on the difference between nature or motives and actions yeah so it's just a kind of assumption really and also an assumption that to be anti-semitic by nature or by motive would be worse somehow than simply doing anti-semitic things uh for some other reason which is not quite explained anyway i'm shutting up now and I, i'll leave you james to get on with it <laughs> okay thank you so um I, i'm nearly there actually but thank you david um if that paragraph is maybe um, a little bit opaque, I don't think there's much um, opaque about the next one. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to juggle various screens. Uh, okay. Here we go. So th this, th I mean, this is pretty strong. Um, uh, I'll just read the start of this. Whilst the tribunal accepts the un undisputed factual evidence relating to each of the matters complained of on crucial issues related to the events, it is found that on occasions on the face of the documents, the respondent's account is implausible and untrue and has rejected his evidence. I mean, again, this Church of England doesn't normally make strong statements about anything but that is pretty strong and damning uh, evidence of um, uh, on Stephen Sizer's character. Um, I will read the rest of the paragraph, actually. In the tribunal's opinion, he is someone who believes passionately in the rights of Palestinian Christians and other Palestinians 
sometimes to the exclusion of values that he knows or should have known that he's required to uphold as an ordained minister. Um, on occasions, the tribunal has concluded that he pushed the boundaries beyond what was acceptable conduct. And in January of 2015, he engaged in anti-Semitic activity when he knew, as the tribunal finds, that the article he was posting was brilliantly anti-Semitic. And that's pretty strong stuff. Um, no doubt there's lots more that could be said about that judgment. Um, bit of technical stuff, um, no sentence yet. That will be a separate judgment. Um, I don't know the date of that separate judgment. Um, I'm told he does have 28 days to appeal, which would put any penalty on stay. Um, and as I mentioned at the uh, uh, short while ago, this is a Church of England tribunal. It doesn't establish a precedent for other courts um, elsewhere in the legal system or even for other courts in the Church of England. OK, um, it doesn't establish a binding precedent to follow. Um, I have one last slide, and this is um, quite a, a personal one to me, really, um, which is about Stephen Sides' involvement with Viva Palestina. So some of you um, will no doubt remember that in 2008, 2009, George Galloway set up, uh, the, the former MP, George Galloway, set up a organisation, a charity called Viva Palestina, um, which the ostensible aim was to raise money and aid for Gaza. What actually happened was George Galloway um, broke the uh, the blockade. He tried to Gaza and he handed over large wads of cash to George Galloway, which was picked up on TV and circulated widely um, around the world. Um, in 2009, Stephen Sizer attempted to divert church funds, uh, several hundred pounds, towards Viva Palestina. Um, he was thwarted because of opposition from within his congregation. Um, this came to my attention in 2012, and I wrote a couple of blog posts about it with a, uh, an, another friend who's been on Stephen Sizer's case for a long time. We wrote a couple of blog posts about it, one which was posted on a Christian site and one which was posted on uh, Harry's Place, which I'm sure some of you will know as a sort of uh, left of centre political blog. Um, and then we we both forgot about it until um, last year when uh, Priti Patel um, changed the legal status of Hamas um, so that both its political and military wings would be prescribed terrorist organisations. Um, and that sort of jogged my memory about what had happened in, in 2009. So we wrote another blog post about it, um, about Stephen Sizer's attempt to divert funds to Viva Palestina. Um, and we also talked about other Christian ministers who had this flagged up to them, but didn't think it was a particular problem. Um, and following that blog post, Stephen Sizer tried to, or he threatened to sue us for libel. And he sent me um, and my co-writer and the publisher, he sent us three letters or a solicitor sent us three letters between December last year and um, April, I think, of this year, um, which we had to respond to. So we had to pay lawyers to defend us. Um, and he didn't, uh, the, the, the time limit for him to issue a claim expired yesterday. He didn't issue a claim and very glad that he didn't, but it doesn't surprise me because what we wrote was true. We have the evidence to prove it and he didn't bring in claim. Um, so it is, um, this is something that's separate from the tribunal verdict. It wasn't something that the board considered, but it is a matter of fact that in addition to having a finding against him, the engaging conduct and becoming of a clergyman and that he engaged in anti-Semitic activity, Stephen Sizer also tried to divert several hundred pounds of church money towards an organisation linked to Hamas. Um, the time to issue expired yesterday. Um, it wasn't at all planned that the verdict would come out today, but in the space of 24 hours, okay, two things um, have been confirmed. One, that he tried to divert funds to Viva Palestina, and one that um, uh, he engaged in conduct unbecoming of a clergyman, 
and engaged in anti-Semitic activity. Um, and that is all I have to say. So I'm going to stop sharing. And if anyone has any questions they want to ask me, um, they are they're, they're very welcome to 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 do that. And I'll try and answer. Um, thank you very, very much, um, James. Um, I will um, certainly open the floor um, to questions. Uh, somebody's putting their hand up literally. Um, other people can use their um, uh, virtual yellow hands. Um, Richard, um, people please make sure that they're muted um, unless they are speaking. Um, let good evening. Ask... Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, James, for um, your description of what went on today. And congratulations to you and to Marie and to uh, Jonathan Arkush as well. Um, thank thank you. I should just say that the congratulations are due to the board. I didn't have any involvement in this complaint. No, reflective, re reflective congratulations then. <laughs> um, Very kind, thank you. What, what the fact that this notorious man, um, dare I say that, who has now been found to be an anti semite officially uh, by the tribunal, um, dare, dare I say that this particular man who was a vicar of the Church of England at Christchurch in Virginia Water for 20 years, what does that say about his community and the state of... of um, Christian Jewish affairs in this country today? Uh, yeah, I think that's a very good question. Um, certainly, his, that there were representations made to people behind the scenes in his own congregation, so the parish council and other leaders that, you know, this was a problem. Um, and certainly, um, other leaders within his network. So I said at the start, he's an evangelical. So within the Church of England, there are lots and lots of different groupings, one of which is evangelical groupings, and lots and lots of evangelical Anglican leaders were approached and asked to do something about him. And almost without fail, they refused to do that or look the other way. So, yeah, that's a very uh, pertinent question. Thanks very, very much. Um, uh, Carrie. Nelson, you're very welcome. Um, please ask your question. Yeah, thank you for this. And it's great to have a reflection on this decision within three milliseconds of the decision being made that gets you, I think, some kind of record. Um, I think that I think it's I want to make a comment and then let you comment on it if you'd like. First of all, I think it's correct that he was not exonerated from being an anti-Semite. They just reach no decision about that. I think that is the accurate way of thinking about it. But my comment is to suggest that it, trying not to adjudicate the question of what someone's fundamental essential character is, is in part a sort of tactical decision that it makes it uh, easier for a panel to reach a conclusion about the character of the activities someone is engaged in, rather than trying to decide what the nature of their soul is. Even though, given his history, and I've, I've read stuff about his history before, it does seem plausible to reach the conclusion that the guy is an anti-Semite, right? I mean, that it seems manageable. It's a diff more difficult conclusion to reach on the basis of a one-off activity, but this guy does stuff over and over again. Nonetheless, it, it's much harder to get a panel to agree, I think, on a fundamental judgment of character than it is to get a panel to adjudicate the character of activity. And so it seems to be partly a practical decision. Yes, that, that, that may well be correct. Certainly it's easier to look at what people have said and what people have done than to try to work out what's going on in their inside their heads or inside their soul. So yeah, that it may that may well be um, mm -hmm. uh, part of the reasoning for that. So and just make one, one of the things Ira lets you do is set aside the distinction of fundamental character and focus on behavior. I mean that's right. something I think Ira facilitates that distinction. Yes. 
Yep. Should just say, Carrie, I read and enjoyed your recent book. Ah, thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, um, for those of you who subscribe to the Journal of Contemporary Antisemitism, which you should all do, you can read my review of Carrie's book in the next edition. There you go. Oh, Done some plugging for you. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't seen it, so I, I look forward to that. All right. Enough already of the loving. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, I, it, I would like to know even, you know, what it could possibly mean to say that somebody is an anti-Semite, uh, because I think that means, you know, something quite profoundly different to different people, and perhaps it has a particular meaning within the church, um, I don't know, um, but um, law in general doesn't judge somebody's inner essence, it judges their actions as people have pointed out very articulately mm -hmm. in the um, uh, chat. Um, Martin, it's an absolute pleasure to meet you. I don't think we've ever spoken before or met before, and it's really a pleasure. Well, we've spoken before, but not in person um, and uh, not with pictures, so. Um, yeah, we've all, yeah, we've all, we've always missed each other, um, various things. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, really just to echo that, you know, this kind of question of intentionality, um, you know, it's obviously, and thanks, James, for the kind of really forensic analysis. It was fascinating. And the um, the question of, you know, the kind of motivation, the soul, um, the separation of kind of intentionality from effect. I mean, it reminded me actually of Jonathan Littell's really problematic novel, The Kindly Ones, where kind of mass murder was like serendipitous and accidental and somehow not the product of intention. Um, you know, and, you know, this question of anti-Semite and anti-Semitism, you know, is... Um, you know, the practice, um, you know, of anti-Semitism is a condemnation and it's really important to kind of think about, <clears throat> you know, not just that kind of intention, you know, you know, you, but but actually the, 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 the results, but that's something that you've already pointed to already. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Martin. Um, Steve, you also are very, very welcome. Um, and you are a particular friend of the London Centre for the study of contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, but I've now lost your picture. Um, While you're looking for it, David, uh, Tammy, the answer is the board have issued a statement. The board of deputies has issued a statement on there website and on their Twitter and Facebook feed. Steve, um, would you like to speak? Uh, can you not hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you, yeah. but I can't see you. You can't see me. Uh, Okay, I don't know how to get that picture off anyhow. Uh, the uh, the question I have is if if the label anti-Semitism is avoided uh, at all costs, what would have been the fallout had he been charged with it? It seems like it's the most severe thing that was uh, issued during the uh, and avoided during the uh, at any cost. Let's not give this guy the label of anti-Semitism or call him anything close to it. It's, it's striking, that's all, uh, by its omission. Does, uh, what would have been the fallout or the penalty? So, so there, there is no penalty has yet been decided. Okay, okay. that'd be for a separate judgment. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow your question, Steve. Do, well, do the you... question is, is, at no point uh, is the, uh, is the term, or uh, they can't make the anti-Semitism charge stick to this guy, right? Nobody- well, well, that, that's, that's not quite, I don't know, that's quite correct. Okay, um, then I missed that, what, I'm sorry. What, what they have not said is, this guy is an anti-Semite. They've not said, this guy is anti-Semitic in its mm. core, in its soul. But what they have said is that he did engage in anti-Semitic activity. But also what they've said, I think, is they've kind of made it look as though they've said that he's not anti-Semitic in his soul. 
but they haven't actually said that. So they've said that, that their verdict is compatible with people who have said that he's not in himself anti-Semitic, but they haven't said that it's that it's uh, not compatible with someone who says that he is. So I think they've come up with a form of words which appears to say that he's not anti-Semitic in himself, but it doesn't say that. And uh, you have to think that's deliberate, don't you, James? I mean, they will want to, like any judicial panel, they will want to avoid being appealed. Okay. And I'm sure there is probably stuff going on in the background in, in you know, where they want to avoid lots and lots of mishap with the Church of England uh, or, or, or the board of deputies. So they've come up, I think, with a very careful form of wording where they're not mm. making a character, they're not making an enduring judgment on someone's character, but nor are they saying this guy never did anything anti-Semitic. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, what's the, does anybody know the bar or the level that one would have to reach in order to be called or declared anti-Semitic mm. in his soul, in his body, in his ego? Uh, but but I also think it's important that they haven't said that he's not, right? That they've given a form of words that kind of makes a casual reader think that they've said he's not anti-Semitic in his heart. But they haven't said that. They've just said that what they say is, is compatible with somebody who says that. Okay. They've said we've not concluded that he is anti-Semitic in his nature. But well, nor have they specifically said that he isn't. Will they Which, issue a statement as as to their conclusions if they? Uh, are I mean, they you, this is it. I mean, the judgment is online, and there is a link to it uh, yeah. further up the the chat. But hang on, that that is the statement. The statement is that they've made particular determinations about the counts, the things that he has done, including determining that one of them is anti-Semitic, and others of them are, you know, various sort of lesser charges provocative against Jews or whatever, but they haven't, and, and kind of rightly, they haven't made a judgment about whether he's anti-Semitic in his soul or not, because anyway, it's not at all clear what that might mean independently of the things that he does. Oh. I mean, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, James, maybe in a church court, the church court is a place to look into somebody's soul. I don't know, but uh, this is not my province. Um, <laughs> shall I go to Steve? Um, um, oh. oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Peter was first. Um, Peter Houston. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Peter Houston from South Africa. I'm a ordained Anglican priest in the evangelical persuasion. Um, I'm also a, a canon theologian in, in my uh, diocese. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this conversation. Um, I'm intrigued by where the Church of England has uh, come down uh, in the, its statement. Uh, from our South African context, we have many people making racist utterances, and when it goes towards a, a tribunal, whether it's within a church or at a school level or in the uh, Human Rights uh, Commission, their actions are judged, not, not their intention, not their motivation, not their character. It's have had what you said. Is is it read as being racist in light of an historic context? Um, I think of uh, you know, the Holocaust and and, and Nazism, where, where people judged on whether their character was that of a Nazi or their motivation, or is it down to what actions were taken and and what that led to and the facts around that matters. So. I'm a bit cynical in, in the judgment uh, that's been handed down, that it's a classic uh, genius uh, church obfuscation that allows every side to read whatever they want to into it. Um, and by saying, but in his nature, he's not an anti-Semite, well, that opens a very problematic door. Uh, a tribunal shouldn't be judging nature. It should be looking at the, the evidence of, of how his actions were perceived, how his words were received in this actual context, historic context. But, but they, what they say is 
we have not concluded that he is anti-Semitic in his nature. Mm. But they have but left what? that possibility open. But why would they presume to even seek to determine his nature and his character? But that actually, they haven't. Good they haven't. They've said that uh, it's compatible with um, him not being anti-Semitic in his, in his nature. Um, but they haven't presumed to determine that at all. And they have, in fact, focused on the charge on the counts of what he did. Yeah, which, you know, I would, in a court, you want, what do you want the judge or the panel to do? You want them to look at people's actions and, and, and people's words. Now, maybe it would have been better if they had not said anything at all about what they've concluded about his nature. But they did, and, you know, I, I don't know what, I don't know why they said that, but, but there we go. What we do have is a clear verdict that he did, on at least one occasion, do stuff which was anti-Semitic, you know, anti-Semitic activity. Um, I'm going to go to Steve Cook. Steve Cook. Hi there. I think I think the anti-Semitic by nature uh, thing kind of is the point. I mean, if, if someone goes on trial for burglary and they're found guilty, they're not found guilty of being a burglar. They're found guilty of the particular acts of burglary that are in the trial. Uh, I mean whether they are a burglary or a criminal in you know in their soul is, is a judgment that members of the public make or observers or people it's not it's not a thing that a tribunal finds here so they're just saying they they don't find that it i suppose it's a it's a bit of waffle really of course it's kind of an aside that some people are going to focus on so already this evening we've had jewish voice for labor who are the anti-zionist group that have defended a lot of anti-Semites anti or people who have engaged in anti-Semitism. They're, mm. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're putting out the Islamic Human Rights Commission statement saying the tribunal rejects accusation uh, of anti-Semitism against former vicar Stephen Sizer. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of pretty ridiculous. I mean, when we go into the verdict, it, it it, about that thing, it says it rejects the respondent's assertion that the article raised serious, serious issues that require public consideration. The article goes far further, uh, far beyond the criticism of Israel and is virulently anti-Semitic in its content. It fulfills all the tropes of classic anti-Semitism. Uh, so, you know, he's engaged in anti-Semitic behaviour, and, and that's true about uh, about, you know, Pretty much any verdict on these things, it, it uh, it's the same sort of a uh, spin we've heard from a uh, uh, from a lot of people in uh, over the recent years over the Labour anti-Semitism issue, where they're saying what you just said there is anti-Semitic, and their their response is, "I'm not an anti-Semite. No, I didn't say you were. I just said what you said was." <clears throat> Thanks very much, Steve. Um, yeah, I was just going to say about the um, what was the reaction is very similar to the reaction we saw to the release of the EHRC report and Ford report that people are cherry picking, you know, one line or one paragraph and saying this proves X, Y, and Z, whereas actually it proves not. It doesn't prove X, Y, Z at all, and then they ignore all the rest of it that proves A, B, and C. So I mean, the, the that's a fairly predictable and common. Um, common uh, mm. you know, reaction, but yeah, I mean, fair. But the the um, the one that I saw gave the headline: um, "Sizer is found not guilty of anti-Semitism." Seemed to me actually profoundly dishonest. I mean, it's not just that they cherry picked; they, uh, you know, he was found guilty of doing anti-Semitic things, and then. There's a whole hierarchy of lesser charges. James, have you got any idea how the hierarchy of lesser charges works? Um, it seems to be that the, the sort of the daddy of the charges is anti-Semitic by nature, and then comes a lesser charge which is anti-Semitic by motive, and then a lesser charge is anti-Semitic activity, and then a lesser charge is conduct unbecoming. 
and you kind yeah, of wonder yeah. why it would be under why why something would be un unbecoming if it wasn't anti-Semitic, and then you've got um, provoking the Jewish community, and then you've got offending the Jewish community, and then you've got a lack of sensitivity towards the Jewish community, and what on earth do all these things mean? Yeah, good question. I mean, I'll read out from paragraph two of the judgment. Um, the nature of the complaint is that between 2005 and 2018, so I could even get the judgment up on the screen, would that be helpful? Yeah, okay, let me get the puck. I'll answer your question in a moment, Lynn. Um, let me try and find the judgment and get it up on the screen. Um, it was in the chat earlier. Um, sorry, just bear with me. <clears throat> um, share screen. Here we go. So you can hopefully see. There you go. So can you all see the judgment in front of you? Yep. Yeah. So here's paragraph two. The nature of the complaint is that between 2005 and 2018, the respondent's conduct was unbecoming or inappropriate to the office and work of a clerk in holy orders within yada yada, in that he provoked and offended the Jewish community and or engaged in anti-Semitic activity. Um, so it's quite a carefully worded complaint and the daddy, Okay, what I thought there would be more of in the findings was that he engaged in anti-Semitic activity. Okay, and only one of the findings was it found in any in respect of only one of the allegations was it found that he engaged in anti-Semitic activity. In some of the others, it was found, oops, that he um that his conduct was unbecoming and inappropriate. In all of them, actually, it was found that he provoked and offended the Jewish community. That was found in all of them, but that wasn't that wasn't seen to have much weight. Okay. What the ones that had more weight was that he he did stuff that was unbecoming and or he engaged in anti-Semitic mm. activity. I mean you did so I, I, mean, I think they in, in, in regard to all of these they found that he offended the Jewish community. But to me that in itself you know, lots of things offend. I mean, I do things that offend the Jewish community. Okay, um, lots of things. Lots of we do things here and there that offend the Jewish community or certain members of the Jewish community in one way or another. Um, we all do things to offend each other. You know, maybe not intentionally, but all the time, um, um, and so on. So the 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 big thing. Okay, for me, the big thing is that there's been a finding that he engaged in anti-Semitic activity. It was only in respect of one of the allegations, but that's enough. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, uh, will you unshare, James? I mean, I, I think it's very kind of opaque, actually. Um, I don't really see why an anti-Semitic uh, comment would offend the Jewish community or provoke the Jewish community if it was not anti-Semitic. Um, I don't really know what the, and, and of course we always, we very often seen people pleading guilty of lesser charges. Um, yeah. I mean, Ken Livingston is the expert, right? Ken Livingston will say, well, true, I'm a vulgar man and true, I'm not very smart and true this, true that, true the other, but I'm not anti-Semitic. Um, so, Pleading guilty to a lesser charge is is, is a, a kind of a, an old chestnut. Yes, I agree. Um, Jonathan Meldrum has been waiting patiently. Hello. Bless you. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, so, um, I was just thinking about the um, the points, the um, the individual findings before the end, and. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking about the IHRA, 
which is very action-based, effect-based, sort of um, performance-based, if you like. It's not the IIR, <laughs> and I'm just wondering about this as an application of the IHRA um, standards. I mean, uh, I, and I was, I would just, I guess I was wondering, um, does it look here like they're, they're leaning very, they're treating this as almost like a criminal matter where they're, they're finding intent because they're looking at the points in time where he could have been aware of this or that. Um, so they're, they're looking to find intent. I'm just wondering, how can I say this? That are they asking, are they asking, because um, they're looking to find intent, I think, but are they, all, are they looking to a, to a very, you know, high standard of proof? Are they looking to a criminal standard? Um, is that where it's going to be? not to that, they, uh, the, the standard of proof is the civil standard. So on the balance of probabilities, that's the standard that they used. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite interesting that they, that they look to intent at all, um, in a sense that, um, uh, you, you know, to have this sort of criminal two-part technique with, well, is it criminal technique? Where you're looking at the act and the intent together, whereas the IHRA definition, mm. it's talking about perception. You know, not, it's not about animus, about hatred. Um, and somebody could do something which was anti-Semitic according to IHRA without having any kind of, anything in their mind at all, as long as it was just an objective performance of, um, and I, I guess I'm just feeling very, I'm wondering if they use the right standard. I mean, do you remember the David Panic report a few weeks ago for that the prime minister, that Boris Johnson had commissioned about whether he was, you know, the parliamentary panel had powers to find him guilty of misleading parliament. And, and he, then again, he, David Panic found an intent requirement. And I'm just a bit nervous, is, is, this, is this the way that, things are going. And then Steve Cook raised something wonderful in the comments. He said, you know, have they applied, have they applied Article 7 ECHR to say that 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 IHRA wasn't adopted so it can't be applied to his behaviour? Well, yeah. I mean the the the, the, the Church of England College of Bishops formally adopted IRA in 2018. Okay, in 2018, which is after I think all but one of the allegations, uh, sorry, after all but one of the allegations. So one of the questions was whether it should reply retrospectively. And it seems that, um, again, to just say I only read through the judgment once, but that doesn't seem to have been a problem. And in particular, of the one incident where they said it was conduct unbecoming and it was anti because that took place in 2015. Okay, so the fact that the IRA was adopted only in 2018 doesn't seem to me to have made a huge difference. <clears throat> um, I think um, we are uh, generally coming to the end of our time. Um, James, I want to um, abuse my position yet again and ask you um, actually another question. Go on. Which is this, is it, um, uh, it seems kind of remarkable that the Board of Jewish Deputies has taken a case to a church tribunal and had a successful result. Uh, has such a has the, the the Jewish community ever been to the to a church tribunal before? Um, and is it is it a kind of something quite interesting and new in that sense? Indeed, yeah. What um, I mentioned, I attended the last two days as an observer. And something that was said in the summing up was that this was the first time in the whole of its history, and am I right in thinking the Board of Deputies was founded in 1760, is the first time it has ever brought a complaint of this nature against a clergyman of any Christian denomination. So yes, it's very uh, mm. unusual and unprecedented. And actually related to that question, um, the question of provoking the Jewish community, it, it strikes me, <clears throat> excuse me, it strikes me as being something that has a particular resonance when it's the church that is being accused of that, that, uh, I don't know, you know, any old Joe Schmo can, can provoke the Jewish community, but when somebody who is a sort of 
figure of the church is accused of provoking the Jewish community. It seems to me to have a particular resonance given, you know, the long history of, of um, anti-Semitism in Christianity, really. What sure. do you think? Yeah, I mean, and this does, um, whether when the board formulated that charge that was in their mind, I don't know, it may well have been, but in, you know, in several of the, as we go through the, the, the verdict on particular allegations, we do see things, um, we do see phrases that, um, that, that this phrase does come out that, um, I'm just trying to find an example, um, Uh, sorry, bear with me. Um, th there were examples, and we saw them on the slides, where the um, where the panel said um, things like, um, "Yeah, once again, it demonstrated his lack of awareness of being a public representative of the church, and showed a lack of sensitivity to the Jewish community." Um, that was what it said in relation to one of the charges. Uh, in relation to another, it said um, said that in relation to charge seven. Um, so yeah, certainly that is there in the background. Oh, here's another one, charge three, an example where he did not take into account his role as a public representative mm -hmm. of the church, showed a lack of sensitivity to the Jewish community. So that, that theme does come out in the judgment. Um, there isn't as much as I think there maybe could have been, at least not on my one reading about, you know, the long history of um, anti-Semitism in the church. Um, I mean, there are, there's a ref, there is a reference earlier on to reports about Christian Jewish relations. The, the, the bishop who gave expert evidence on behalf of the board, he does stuff specialised on interfaith. Um, there was reference to um, something Justin Welby has written about anti-Semitism. So that's there in the background. It's maybe not as explicit in the verdict as it might have been, but but it, but it is there. I don't know if that answers mm. your question. James, uh, I want to thank you really um, a lot for um, this event. And I'm quite excited because it is the first kind of... Uh, quickly organized and topical event that the uh, the London Center for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism has organized. And I think it's worked really well. Um, and I'm very uh, pleased with that. Um, and I'm gonna ask people for money. <laughs> um, and there is the link uh, by which you can donate to the London Center. Uh, we haven't charged anybody for entry. And so if you would like to uh, donate, the amount that one would expect to donate for such a brilliant uh, briefing, then please do. And if you don't know us very well yet, here is the website of the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism, which is very easy to remember because it's www.londonantisemitism.com. Um, and there also you can sign up to um, receive our mailings, and you can also find us on. Twitter and on Facebook. Um, so uh, thank you very, very much to everybody for coming and thank you, James, for that um, really uh, quick footed, swift footed um, uh, analysis. And um, I think it leaves uh, Roy Keane in, in the shadows really. Um, so thank you very, very much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you all for coming. I should, uh, I don't know if this is needed, but I'm sorry there was a bit of um, background movement. Um, couple of people I shared the office with um, listened in. I don't know whether they have chosen to listen in, but um, <laughs> they were working in the background. One of them is an Arsenal fan, David, so I'm sure you would, uh, would approve. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you, everybody. And make sure you take the link for the um, donation platform. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks, everyone.